Dante Muse, author of Tripping Over Canvases, How to Become a Successful Entrepreneur, and art director here at Above Art Studios, located downtown in Brunswick, New Jersey. Welcome to another episode of the Art Life Podcast, where we are at the intersection of art and commerce. We have with us a very special guest today, um, definitely lining up. We're going to be big friends. Uh, welcome today with us, Miss Shana Nice Dambrot. Welcome, Hello. Shana. Dante. Thank I'm you. so excited to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Okay. I really am. I'm. 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 I love what you're doing, and I'm. I'm really excited to to contribute. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, and so you usually are the one doing all the interviews. Um, you're usually on the, on the other end. So, you know, I know you're probably not as celebrated as I think you should be. And I happen to also, uh, be a writer. So maybe I'm a little partial, you know, but I definitely think you, you should be more, more celebrated. Um, but I know you're into a, a few different things and probably even more than I've discovered. Um, but tell us a little bit about what it is that that you do. So currently, as far as writing, um, you know, who, who are you writing for? Who are you contributing to? Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, God, I'm into stuff that like half the time I don't even know what it is. I'm just like I say yes. And then I'm like, oh, I. I guess I'm involved in that because I just love everything so much all the time. Uh, but yeah, so I'm an art critic. That's like the main thing. But then there's so many vectors that come off of that. So I've been in LA like 25 years and I've written for a ton of places um, in that time. But at, at the moment, I'm settled into being the arts editor at the LA Weekly, which I've been for the last few years. Um, I had written for the weekly several like many at many points during the last 25 years you know you, we all all the freelancers in LA kind of dip in and out of the weekly uh, mm -hmm. over time it's it's, it's funny uh, but so at the moment I'm the arts editor so I run the art the visual and some other um, aspects of like performing arts and a little bit of literature coverage at the paper and then um, I also write um, for um, flaunt magazine a few times a year for Artillery Magazine, where I do art, the straight, up, straight ahead art criticism mostly. Um, art and Cake, again, is exhibition reviews. So that's kind of that. And then I have a whole section that is um, books and exhibition catalogs and, you know, catalog functionality, even if it only exists as a website, but, you know, what you would expect in the introductory, introductory essay to an exhibition a book, um, so a lot, a lot of that kind of work directly with artists, galleries, institutions. Um, I wrote this past year a novel of my own, which was like amazing and terrifying. And um, <laughs> that's a whole other sort of like uh, telescope flip, you know, on mm -hmm. what artists go through when they're coming this way. Now I understand like, I mean, I did before, but now I have just like this profound empathy for how hard and scary it is to make something personal like that and put it out into the world. So that's a whole new dimension. Um, and then, yeah, there's always, you know, talks and, you know, a little bit of teaching, lecturing, whatever, but it all comes out of that base of writing about visual art. So you've always written about the arts? Yeah, I mean, it's funny to like look back on the decision making process of my youth, but like I never had a plan B, right? It was like I grew up in New York. I spent a lot of my childhood cruising the halls and gardens of the Museum of Modern Art and and the Met and the Natural History Museum and falling in love with weird random paintings and wanting to know more about it and then you know, being the one that knew stuff on like the high school tour of the Picasso show and kind of like docenting my friends. And when it was time to pick a college, I thought, okay, art history, obviously 
picked the school I wanted to go to, applied early, went there, studied art history. Like I never, but it wasn't, I wouldn't describe it as like a single-minded focus. It was just more like, it seemed obvious to me, like, oh, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And it wasn't until much later that I realized that that was maybe um, unusual in some way, but yeah, it's been pretty, like, this is what I, and then I, you know, I studied art history in college and I thought, what job exists where you get to look at art all day and then, you know, stay up late writing about it at night, arguing about it with your friends. I'm like, is that a job? And then um, that's the job I have. So. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Most people aren't uh, operating as intuitively as you, you operated uh, throughout your career. So that's, that's amazing. First and foremost, um, I mean, if only I would have followed some signs earlier on, but in hindsight, I needed those experiences, you know, to do what it is I'm doing now. Exactly. Um, I mean, there's no wrong path. I yeah. just, I amuse myself when I think about, and I think about things, you know, the ways in which I got lucky, like my parents never said like, art school is a bad idea. You know, they just yeah. were like, uh, you know, supportive, right? And it's not like there was money around, but they were helpful in my, you know, financial aid and student loans. And like, they helped make it happen, um, which again, it was only later um, when I started really being immersed in a community of artists that I really deeply understood what a frightening scary challenge and struggle a lot of people went through to create a life for themselves in the arts in 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 so many instances because it was their parents who were you know worried about their financial security that's the straight up one right what are you going to do with an art degree and so yeah i never tire of honoring my parents willingness to entertain that crazy idea yeah, that's definitely amazing. Um, yeah, majority of artists do shy away from that. Um, is in artists, I'm sure they are, we already have our own, uh, you know, insecurities. And but now, when you add extra layers on top of it, and people kind of confirming that it's going to be difficult, you know, you're going to be a starving artist. You know, all that sinks in and it starts to play itself out. Uh, it manifests itself because that's what you actually believe. Um, right. So yeah, we're we're on a mission to uh, combat that. 100%. Exactly. I, what can I do to help? Like, just do it, kids. You know what I mean? But it's <laughs> it's, it's kind of like there's so many, you know. But it, it's such an interesting thing, and I love what you said though too, because you know everyone's path through life is different, and it could be that being forced to examine your passion for art and recommit yourself even after you know it's going to be hard and all the experiences you have you know as in day jobs and pursuing education in other ways and creating opportunities for yourself like and all of the life experiences that are not from the art world if you know that that's going to be someone's you know path too and you know so as I think the only thing that really matters is sticking with it in whatever form your your life um, you know has room for. So, how does one become an art critic? Because I mean, technically, I guess you know everybody critiques everything, but like to actually have that title to where you're not the only one calling yourself that, other people are actually calling you for that, and you're you're, you know, getting paid to be that. Like, how, how does that happen? Like, I never understood that. I know it's kind of crazy. And again, like, I just kind of like did it, you know what I mean? But, um, and, and also too, this is such an interesting question because thanks to um, mostly the rise of technologies and then all of the follow on effects from that, I would not have answered that question the same way 15, 10, five years ago, or like yesterday. That makes so, sense. So, right, when I did it, um, which I got, I got out of school in like 1993, and I had worked at galleries. I had interned at some fancy New York galleries, and I first job out of college, I was a job um, at the at the Guggenheim Museum. So, 
you know, it wasn't like I graduated and then I got a job as an art critic. Like I too had the path of every freelance writer in any field that you're in, any kind of journalism or essay writing or just like any kind of writer. If you're a freelance person, I did that too. It was 10 years of day jobs. You, they, I mostly worked in galleries and art related businesses so that at least it wasn't like fully separate. Um, but you know, a performer waiting tables or driving lift. And then you, you know, there's like any day job, right? And I did, I waited tables. I was terrible at it. I mean, just like, <laughs> so, I didn't want to, I didn't want to carry anything. I just wanted to talk to you. I was like, uh, oh, I'll tell you yeah, about the oh, food. You're a hostess, and, yeah. I was hosting. And then they'd be like, that's great. But we actually have half an hour and our sandwich where's our sandwich? And I'd be like, I don't know, know. you know, terrible, but I wanted their story, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, you, you do that. And so I did that. Um, and then one day a job came along that was, um, part-time, but stable. Mm -hmm. And that, then I was able to jettison the day job and do that, which was working at running the LA edition of flavor pill. I was there, second managing editor in LA. And the first um, had to leave because he got a book deal. He's a music writer. So, you know, thing, you move people around. So he got a book deal, I took over and I did that for a number of years. And that created a really nice, not enough money by itself, but a nice like foundation. And then I was able to focus on pitching to like other art magazines and other places like that. And, this, and that was right on the bubble when print and the internet was first kind of happening. Okay. And then subsequently everything that's happened with um, the publishing world in general, with the internet has also happened in art publishing, of course. Um, but by then I had, you know, like a solid career and a hardcore resume and a body of work that I could point to. And, um, and, and so as we moved into the internet age, I was able to kind of like, you know, be a person who was getting paid to write for the internet. Remember, that used to happen. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and then, right. And then after that, now it's it's just been a question of, um, you know, sticking with that, but that that was kind of the shape of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, this is all, this is all amazing. This is definitely a, a, a unique journey. Yeah, like, um, but a part-time, a part-time stable gig I think is the perfect foundation for any freelance career because you know, okay, I'm making four or $500 a week, not enough to live on, but enough to pay my rent and not wake up freaking out every day. <laughs> yeah. And then you have about half of the rest of your time for everything else you want to do. And it's a hustle, but it's doable. Um, and so I think like that's, that's kind of the shape of most writers that I know have that shape. Almost no writers that I know are, are seriously full time at one place only, and that's it. Yeah, Most yeah. of us have kind of a base, and then we do other things. So that's that's yeah, that's how it happens. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. I um, just lived long enough to be considered. A <laughs> My hair turned gray, and they were like, "She must know what she's talking about." Yeah, she's she's a sage now. <laughs> All right, so. You touched on something, um, which I'm sure is the reverse now, but um, you were seeking out the publications, um, you know, in the platforms initially. So um, tell us a little bit about that process. Like, how would you approach, you know, somebody that you wanted to write for and you never written for anybody before, you know, type of thing, a new writer wanted to come out and, you know, contribute to a magazine or something. Yeah. I mean, God, I, this is another one of those things. I have been fortunate in that things kind of like have led to each other. So mm -hmm. I, I haven't done very much at all of that classic sort of query letter where you kind of like half write like a little synopsis of what you plan to do and you send it to an editor you've never worked with before and you hope, you know, it gets through and matches up. 
I get a lot of those at the weekly and I, and I understand that they're important to the function of journalism because we're out, people are writers are out there having their own ideas, right? Um, not everyone, you know, is being assigned ahead of time. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, like I said, I haven't had a ton of that. The, even the flavor pill thing happened because I had, was writing for this Italian art magazine and my editor there, who's an amazing woman named Michela Giovanotti, she's a curator in New York. Um, at that time, her partner's best friend was one of the people who, or one of his best friends, was one of the people who founded Flavor Pill. And they were like asking their circle of friends, do you know any cool culture writers in LA? And Michaela said, I know one. She's been writing about art in LA for me for a couple of years. She seems rad, call her. And that was me. Okay. So that, right, that kind of thing happens. And then later I'd get an email from somebody starting a new program at KCET that said, you know, I've been an, an OG Flavor Pill subscriber and I know you're not there anymore, but I'm a fan of what you did and I'm wondering if you want to be part of this. Oh, yes, please. And then once you're due, and then after that, I send pitches. So I've not sent a lot of cold call type stuff, but that said, everything is a pitch process. Okay, we're coming up for on the deadlines for exhibition reviews for the February issue. Please send us your top three stories you would like to write or exhibitions you'd like to review that you can see and have written about by this deadline. And then I say, okay, these three were my favorite shows of the last two months. And then the editor, you know, with their overview of their whole editorial slate, picks the one they most want, and then they accept it. So I still definitely pitch all the time. It's just that it's hardly ever cold in that way. All right. And so what would be the recommended process for a new writer trying to get through to you or, you know, get in any of the publications that you're in? Yes. Um, okay, so there, there's like structural stuff and each publication's a little different. They all have a contact page and you know, most of the good ones will call out at the very least where you should send pitches. Many of them will call out and give the emails for the actual like editors of the section that you, you know, so like in LA Weekly, you know, um, I get art and music pitches. The music pitches don't really land because we have a music editor. So there's some crossover, but you can kind of go on and find each of us separately for your section. And most places are organized that way. I mean, the most important thing to me in a pitch letter, the, the single most important thing is some kind of proof that you've read the magazine like once or twice. You know makes, what I mean? Makes sense. Yeah. Like, know what we do here. Be even able to say, you know, dear Miss Dambrod, I really enjoyed, um, you know, your writer, Shante Griffin's coverage of the exhibition at this gallery. And, you know, it made me feel like you might be interested in this story that I have in mind. And then I'm like, okay, cool. Like, you... It, you know, like it just feel, you know, it's just like yeah. human, you know? Um, and that always makes the editor who gets 300 emails a day feel that that person has already taken a step to be um, in an honoring relationship with you and does read the magazine or does read the paper. And that's, you know, it's a small thing, but it's so huge. And that's the kind of thing that makes a busy editor read the rest of the email. Yeah. Right. And I, I don't want it to sound like ass kissing because that's not what I mean. It's not yeah. like, hey, I think you're the best writer in L.A. Please. It, no, 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 no. Just that little bit of like, I know what you do there and I like it and I want to be part of it. It goes such a long way towards cutting through the noise. Yeah, it's, it's one. It's kind of assuring you like it's OK to read this because I'm not wasting your time. You know, there's probably some type of alignment here, uh, you know, whether it's you just like cut and paste and I sent the same email yeah. to 35 people and, you know, actually like 
your auto format fucked up and I got someone else's email and now I know you just sent the same email to 30 other people. Like just little things like that, that we all value each other's time. I think it's just, it's kind. And then who doesn't respond well to that? Yes, you know? definitely. Yeah, yeah I, I, I could tell the difference. It would be a difference in me responding too. Like, so I already know. I was like, oh, all right, well, let me let me see what's going on here. Or they so, misspell your name, and you're like, oh. it's actually Dante with an O. <laughs> and this whole part about what a big fan of mine you are, maybe not so much. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I can tell by that file that you've the got in those emails. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's it's nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. All right. Um. Oh, this is this is a whole lot. So tell me um, about your first job at the Guggenheim. You said you were at the Guggenheim. Yeah. So yeah, you- that was interesting. Um, it actually, I was um, an assistant in their um, in a, an education program that they were running at the time, and so most of the writing that I did was grant writing. But it was, you know, which is valuable experience Definitely. anyway. And it's still writing about art. But what the, what the program did real quick was they paid, it was in New York and it start, had started in the 80s. And um, they paid working artists to go into New York City public schools and teach art classes because arts had been slashed from the New York City public school budget. Okay. So we were writing grants to support that. And it was hiring working artists and they would do, you know, puppetry and clowning and watercolor and, you know, with the kids and then there'd be a big exhibition at the end of every school year with work from all the kids in the classes and, you know, at the Guggenheim and you could just see like their faces, you know, they did a Roy Lichtenstein show that we did a whole like um, learning cycle that was based on Marvel comics universe and the crossover with Lichtenstein painting. So that was a really rewarding job. And I don't think I would have left it if I had stayed in New York. I mean, it was, it was great, um, but I moved to LA. Um, so that, yeah. What got you to LA? Um, well, there, the, the you truth is- You either a man or money, so I don't know. No, oh, weirdly neither. <laughs> it was like my, friend, my best friend from school and totally broke ass. No, I, well, the good time <laughs> job was amazing, but it was starting to, um, it was starting to get a little corporate and okay. I was still 23 and I was like, I don't, and again, sort of like being bad at other jobs. Like I just, I could feel myself chafing against it. I was getting in a little bit of trouble at work and I was at this crossroads where I was like, okay, I'm either going to become this professional mini woman at age 24 or I'm going to take this opportunity that's presented to do like a crazy thing before I'm too old to do something crazy. Uh, so my best friend from college had moved to Venice Beach and opened an art gallery. And I was like, yep, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. And I just moved to Venice and um, got a job at a gallery in, in uh, Santa Monica and then started the whole freelance jigsaw. Okay. Yeah. That took a lot of courage. I did it the same way. I, you're learning a lot about my decision-making process, which is freaking random because I, <laughs> I, it was even worse than that, Dante. I came to visit her in, because it was February and cold in New York. Mm-hmm. I came to visit her for a week and never went back. I mean, if that was the time to sell you on the weather, February was definitely the time to sell you on the weather. I yeah, I sent my roommates money and letters of apology and asked them to <laughs> my stuff. And I just, that, I, yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was 26 years ago. It worked out well for you. Definitely worked out well for you. So these um, exhibition, um, what is it? Uh, not an exhibition of appraisal or uh, uh, review is that's that's what it was so what makes for a good exhibition like what what can you be expecting like a good review of an exhibition like I'm trying to tighten up my exhibitions so give me some tips on okay. how to tighten up my exhibitions 
Well, God, you know, it's so funny because, you know, even as a sort of like authority voice of, you know, arbiter, I, uh, I completely understand that art is still, you know, the very definition of subjective. But that said, we've all seen art that we know is incredible and we've all seen art that we know is terrible. <laughs> so there is some kind of continuum that we can agree on even within taste. Yes. Uh, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, to me, when I decide if work is good, you know, at, it's not always the same as work that I like. They're not, they're uh, not, those two things are not the same as much as one might think. Yeah. And I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think a lot of critics feel this way where really the metric that we're trying to measure work by a lot of it is measured by the artist's stated intentions. So if you as the artist are saying, I want you to feel some kind of certain way, I want this to be the takeaway from the experience or these are the issues or whether they be political or simply issues about the physicality of pure paint in an abstract way or whatever it is that you're trying to do. If you're clear with it and I, I, then I can look and say, did they get where they said they wanted to go? Yes or no. And the, the example I always like to use is like, I do not care for impressionist painting. Okay. I yeah. barely like Van Gogh and the rest of them, it's like, I can't. But I'm not gonna try to talk people out of liking Manet and Monet and Red Water. Like if you, I mean, love it, go love it. I don't care. Like, obviously it's beautiful, whatever but it doesn't do that thing to me. Um, but I'm, I wouldn't like look at a Cezanne show and give it a bad review on the merits of the painting because that ship has sailed. And anyway, their stated purpose was to kind of fuck up the field of vision because the modern age demands a new way of looking at the world. And they did that, they did that. 150% success with their stated mission. A lot of people love the work. They had technique, they developed their ideas, they were rigorous, they were serious, it changed the world, at least in Western art history. So I'm not gonna put my, my personal taste up against the obviousness of the success of the undertaking in that way. And you know, you've got this, um, this portrait of Basquiat behind you. He's such a perfect example of that because the work is really difficult and challenging. It's not pretty, it's not pleasant, it's not feel good. That work is upsetting, right? At yeah, yeah, it definitely the better is. better it is, the more upsetting it is. So yeah. do I like it? Oh my God, it, that, it has so little to do with what I like at that point. It's just so disruptive and alive that it's undeniable. So, mm. you know, if there's a Basquiat show, I'm more likely to critique the the pieces that were chosen or some jacked up way they installed something in the presentation, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, and not that everyone out there is, is um, you know, Seurat or Basquiat, but that's kind of the framework. And then I try to apply that. If I, if I walk into a show and I hate, 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 I find that so interesting. I'm like, why do I hate this so much? This is so exciting. Why am I so upset? And I kind of examine that, you know? So uh -huh. there's a lot of ways to move through the space um, that are not just like my taste, absolutely. And, I, and that is a, can be a, a kind of lifelong learning dynamic a little bit too, which keeps it interesting for me. Yeah, definitely. As a writer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you do what you need to do but there's no substitute for that personal engagement. Yes, nice, yeah, I, I like this, I like this a lot. So do you do um, like personal critiques for artists? Like it, so if an artist wanted a critique on a work, like can they, you know, contact you to get a critique on it or, or even for their shows? Like, so how would, um, 
you know, an, an artist or a gallery even go about, you know, getting some type of, uh, you know, coverage or press or critics to come through for an exhibition? So, so the answer is like, sort of, which is just to say, you know, our critic is not exactly the same as journalist, but it's very helpful to think of it as a journalist. So it's not, you know, a gallery cannot pay me to write a review that's going to be in a magazine because that's so like that's all, so many different kinds of unethical because first of all I'm already being paid once from the <laughs> magazine I, you know I my rule is you're paid by one person mm. and then because it takes two things for there to be a conflict so if one person's paying you and you keep that person's best interests in mind mm. right that said of course there's a pitching process so I get emails from publicists and galleries but what they want is coverage in a paper they're not hiring me to do it they are pitching me on covering their content just like any just like anything right yeah. would be um there's a sector that's more like the book stuff that's you know like if you're if you want an essay for the beginning of your catalog you're hiring me to do that um you know, that's a bit more expensive. Well, it's more money than magazines pay, but obviously, because magazines pay like 30 cents a word. So let's hope it's more than that. But it's not like a million dollars. But um, that's something that we work on together. And I'm on your side and I'm helping bring out aspects of your story and your practice that would be most helpful to, you know, but it's for the book. And that, and then if that happens, Never times a million, never, ever, ever would I then ever turn around and review that exhibition as though I were capable of being objective about it because I'm not anymore. Yeah. And I wrote all the best words in your book already. Yeah. <laughs> making me try to do that. So that's the difference, right? Okay. And yeah. And so article, review, essay, you know, and it's kind of up to the, each writer to be an ethical, you know, citizen of the industry, which I pride myself on being. Um, as far as like, you know, a, like if an artist wanted like a critique, like a studio visit or something like that, um, Zoom makes that a lot easier because it, it, it's, a, it, you know, I don't have, I don't have like time, you know, it's a four or five hour yeah. thing, right? Like I... I'm getting ready to go. I'm traveling to you. I'm spending an hour, maybe an hour and a half with you. I'm getting home. That's a whole day. I can't afford to not do any of my work today. You're not, I'm not making you like pay me for that. Um, unless it's at a level of like, I'm hiring you for a professional consultation. I want you to see my work and tell me what to do. Then that's a little gig. But in general, the idea of like, come to my studio and see what I'm up to and let me tell you about myself is not a paid situation. It's just yeah. a like meeting someone not at a gap, you know, and that that's not something that I would do as a paid job, only if it crossed the line into them wanting like professionalized advice. Would I even consider doing that? And even that I do like once every three years because it's just not exactly a good fit for my skill set anyway yeah but it's possible um it, it happens but i'm not yeah so, and that would be useful though but most writers if they have time will just do a studio visit especially now that we're all on zoom they're like yeah i have half an hour show me around your studio and then you talk and that was amazing and it's like you know that was great and most of us love doing that and that's just something you know that we do whenever we have time yeah that yeah that that sounds like a, a nice way to blow some time too like you don't have to get it get up and go anywhere and all that yeah i know i'm i'm a hermit so i i understand that thank you for tuning in to part one of this amazing interview we definitely appreciate all your attention and patronage couldn't do it without you but make sure you come back for part two. That's where all the juicy stuff is. Grab your pen, grab your paper, tune back in. Let's get this art on.